This talk began as a, as a talk for the um, Aquinas Symposium, and the idea was that I would talk about uh, what Augustine and Aquinas had to say on the resurrection of the body. But I thought I'll add a little bit more to make it more interesting and make it more relevant to you. Um, and if you find my talk uninteresting, there are lots of pretty pictures along the way. OK, good. So um, vanity of vanities, says the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. And he goes on, what does man gain by all the toil that, at which he toils under the sun? All things are full of weariness, a man cannot utter it. What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. And there is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of things yet to happen. And then he says, I said to myself, come now, I will make a test of pleasure. Enjoy yourself. But behold, this too is vanity. Then I considered that all that my hands had done and the toil that I had spent in doing it. And behold, all was vanity and a striving after wind. And there was nothing to be gained under the sun. That's a very common feeling, and I think that's a very natural feeling. If we are all going to die, then it doesn't really matter you know, kind of what I do today and what I do tomorrow and what I do the day after, because I'm going to be forgotten. I'm going to dissolve into the dust, and that's all that matters. And this was something that the Hebrews, the Jews, struggled with for a very long time. You know, kind of what happens to us after death? Um, is there going to be anything of me left? And one of the ideas that comes up frequently in, in the uh, uh, scriptures is that, okay, I will die, but then somebody else will carry on. And if you read later on in the book of Ecclesiastes, that too is, is kind of seen as trivial, because who knows who will succeed me? Who knows if he'll be a fool or if he'll be a wise man? He might not even care about me, so why should I care? So, and then suddenly there appears, in the Hebrew scriptures, there appears this idea that, no, after death there will be something, and I myself, as it says in the book of Job, I will see God with my own eyes. And it gets taken up in various of the, of the prophets. And of course, it's fulfilled in the New Testament in the coming of Christ. So the resurrection of Christ, so we're in the season celebrating the resurrection of Christ, but the resurrection of Christ would be completely external. I mean, why would we even care about the resurrection of Christ if it were not for our own resurrection? Because... You know, God, okay, God dies, God rises from the dead. What does this mean for me? So the idea is the resurrection of Christ must be related to what happens to my body, what happens to me, that I must survive. And so St. Paul picks up on this and he says, now if in, this is 1 Corinthians 15, 12, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the, of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. For if the, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. All those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people the most to be pitied. But if in fact Christ, if, but in fact Christ has been raised from the dead, 
the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. And then he goes on to speak about his own mission and why does that matter if Christ is not risen. But then he goes on to say, okay, we say that people will rise from the dead. What does this mean? How are the dead raised? With, raised? with what kind of body do they come? And then he says, what you sow is, is only a kernel. So he's thinking of a wheat grain. And then God gives it a body. There are heavenly bodies and the earthly bodies. But the resurrected body will rise with the glory of Christ. And then he goes on to say a number of things about the resurrected body. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is, it is sown as natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. The first man was from earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of dust. That is, all of us. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, so we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. So the idea is that our bodies will become like Christ's body. But once you say this, and this is what happened over Christian history, a number of problems arise. And this is where kind of uh, the fathers of the church, the saints, take it up. One of them, and this was originally a talk, kind of a zombified, a zombie talk, is what happens with people who have been eaten by other people. Uh, so the idea is, I die, my body, uh, you know, there's a great famine along, and, uh, and somebody comes along and eats my body. So will this part of me rise up as part of me? Will it be my finger, or will it be the... the you know, part of whatever part of the body of the person who eats me. Then there is the question of what happens to my nails and what happens to my hair? I've, I've lost a lot of cells of my body, right, over the course of my life. Uh, I've lost a lot of hair, although I still have a lot of it. Um, so what will happen to all that hair if God says, as, as, as Jesus says in, in the Gospel of Luke, not a hair of your head will be lost. What about those bodies of people which have been mutilated? People who have been born lame or, or uh, lacking eyesight or whatever else. You know? uh, what happens to people who, I don't know, suffer from obesity? Or people who have died in great famine? Um, and, uh, of course, the other question that arises is what happens to those bodies of babies which have been miscarried, right? So some of these ob objections seem somewhat outlandish or silly, but they are actually serious questions. They are questions about what it means to have a body. Like, to what extent does is am I my body? And why do I need to have a body? Then there are other questions like, what is it that makes me, me? So, um, is it enough? So, if, for instance, I die, and my body gets dissolved, and I rise uh, you know, I rise from the dead with, I have a soul, but it's in some kind of more perfect body like Father Manes' body. So, <laughs> so what happens? <laughs> so, what is it that guarantees that it is me, not the body, not Father Manes? So, you know, in modern philosophy, people ask similar sort of questions like, um, what if 
Can you ever do a brain transplant? If you do a brain transplant, who's, who is it? Right? What makes me me? What's the role of bodily imperfection? Do we come back? Am I, you know, to what extent am I identified with, you know, uh, the, the man who has a mole on his uh, thumb? I have a mole on one of my thumbs. So all those sorts of things. So, and of course, what is the nature of the, uh, what is the nature of the transformation that Paul speaks about? In what sense will we be made perfect? And these are current questions, because if you ask anybody who goes, walks along on the street, what they believe about the last days, or what they believe of what happens to them after the, after the, after they die, you'll get a variety of different answers. You will get the sort of answer that, um, you know, like people have this idea that there's some, some vague sort of resemblance to a body, but it's not really a body, a bit like this. So the girl who has a kind of an airy, lighty body. Or you'll get the opposite extreme, the kind of the material idea. Um, I die, and the, what is the matter part of me becomes part of the matter of uh, a tree or something else, so I kind of basically dissolve back into the earth. Um, or just, you know, kind of people have this vague idea of spirits, completely invisible, who will never have bodies again. And this is a huge problem, because the resurrection of the body is fundamental to the faith, fundamental to how we see, we as Christians see um, our conti continuity. And as we heard from Paul, you know, if there is no resurrection of the body, then we are of all men to be the most pitied. Um, Vatican II, by uh, one account that I read, according to one of its theologians, uh, Eve Conga, was called to deal with, and, you know, every council is called to deal with a problem. And the problem that Vatican II was called to deal with, apparently, was this belief in the resurrection of the body. And so we come to St. Augustine. So Augustine has this to say, our hope is the resurrection of the dead. Our faith is the resurrection of the dead. Our love, which kindles the preaching of the things which are not seen and ignites our desires, by whose breath our hearts become capable of beatitude. This love of ours, and he switches, he switches topic, he goes from the resurrection of the dead, and then he says, but we are not to be occupied with this love of ours, should not spend itself on earthly things, because we are going to rise from the dead. How does this work? This seems kind of paradoxical. It says, the things around us, the material things around us, are dying. But we are not. We are going to survive for all eternity. If we're going to survive for all eternity, we should expend ourselves on God, who is, who is the only eternal being, right? The only one who, of his own accord, has always existed and will always exist, of his own bat, so to speak. Otherwise, you know, we might as well make ourselves happy. Um, or we might as well take our fun where we, where we will, because we will not be able to make ourselves happy. Therefore, if you take faith away, this is Augustine again, faith in the resurrection of the dead, all Christian doctrine would be at an end. Notice in all this that Augustine does something funny. He simply assumes that resurrection means resurrection of the body. Um, this ties in with both Ecclesiastes, in the sense that it says, uh, what gives my, myself value is that there is some, you know, nothing in, in, in me has any value if I kind of dissolve into the ether, or into the air. And it ties in with Paul, who says that bodies must rise. So, this is kind of the great 
idea. So how do we deal with this idea that we need to, 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 that our bodies will not rise? First he says, where does this come from? What is the problem that people have with the body? One is people feel, and again, this is something today as it was then, people feel that the body is at the root of human sin and human unhappiness. I'm unhappy because I have this flaw in my body, or I am unhappy because I have these chemicals in, my, in me that kind of fluctuate up and down. I sin because I am tempted by things that come out of my body. So this is an old idea, it's still a current idea. And he says, okay, where are you getting things wrong? First thing he says is that, no, your sin does not come from your body at all. Your sin comes from your soul. Your sin comes from the fall. Why do we sin? We sin because we are in the image and likeness of Adam and Eve. Our image, we are like Adam and Eve, and as Adam and Eve turned away from God, we also turn away from God. So what happens? Um, we are put in paradise, we are told you can, do, you, can do, you can have anything you like except this one thing, and then Adam and Eve turn around and say, and they, they take this one thing that they're not supposed to, which is a turning away from God. Now what's happened? The mind or the soul has turned away from God. But then, I am created to be obedient to God. My soul is created to be obedient to God. The punishment for my turning away from God is that a part of me ceases to obey me. This is all very political, if you, if you, uh, if you see what I'm trying to say. It's, the idea is that we are a bit like a society in our body. I know. One part obeys another part, obeys a third part, obeys a fourth part, and so on and so forth, until all the way up to God. So, uh, at the top of the chain is God. My soul obeys God. My body obeys my, my, body obeys my soul. Animals obey me, and so on. Right? Once... Adam turns away from God, the whole thing array, it becomes a chaos. Okay, so this is why we sin. Why we sin is parts of us disobey us. We feel like we would like to do something good, but we don't end up doing it, as Paul complained. Um, we feel tempted. We have an idea that we want to do something, but then after a while, we get tired of it. So uh, we're kind of torn up inside. And this is, this is a very kind of, it's, it's a very nice metaphor, but it actually describes very well what we are, what, what goes on inside us. So the resurrection itself has to be bodily. So in order for this whole thing to be restored, first, my soul has to be obedient to God, which it does through Christ. By, being, by joining oneself to Christ, you are sharing in Jesus' obedience to the Father. Then, your body must be obedient to your soul, because that's the whole restoration of the whole mess of the world. Right? The whole mess of the world is remade. So, this is why... Augustine says we have to have a bodily resurrection because for the society to be, to be fully restored, for God's creation to be completely full, my body has to obey my soul, my soul has to obey God, and, my, and all other things are beneath me. So that's the full restoration. 
But also, Augustine has this great thing about this great emphasis on the beauty of creation. Every part of creation, this is, this is a very fundamental idea in Augustine, and in fact in all of Christian civilization. The world is created. The fact that it is created means that it is good. This is one of the things that distinguishes Christianity from almost every other religion. The world is good and glorious because it is created. Um, so it's the whole idea of all the parts of my body fit together. They make sense. They are, I'm meant to be who I am with my body, with my beard. We'll talk about beards a little bit later. So there's the idea of the beauty of the body. And then he goes on to say, OK, people say that the bo uh, OK, some people will claim that there is no bodily resurrection. But then he goes on to say, point out something quite funny. He says, but when these people speak about resurrection, they kind of imagine the soul returning to the body, leaving that body, coming again into a different body. They, they themselves see the necessity of a, of a body. If you look at this picture, for instance, there is still um, a form, a shape of a body, a shape of a, of a dog, a shape of a, of a woman, of a girl. Um, we, don't, we aren't able to think of anything. It's, it's natural to think of bodies. Even um, in classical literature, souls in bliss will eventually desire to enter into bodies. And, but then, how do we escape evil? Comes back to that. We escape evil because we are obedient to God. And so what of all of those objections? The objection about cannibalism, the objection about you know, imperfect bodies, all of that. The fundamental idea is that God is not limited by what Plato or any of the ancient philosophers imagine. God can restore our bodies. That is because the, one, the God who restores our bodies is the same one who created us. So the one who created us can recreate us. He is not limited by what we think he can do. And so, what happens to our bodies in the resurrection? And this, uh, Augustine basically lays down an, a set of ideas as to what will happen. First he says, what does it mean for, for it to be a spiritual body? A body which is entirely subject to the soul. It has no desire for earthly or fleshly things. It, is, it automatically desires God and the things of God perfectly. So that's what will happen to us in heaven. Then we will, have, we will be free from death and corruption. That's, that's, that's one of the fu fundamental things, that the, the things in us will no longer be at war with each other. They will no longer disintegrate. What happens to our? What happens in the to our? You know, he goes into detail. So, what happens to, for instance, what happens to our insides? So, one of the one of the basic Platonic problems, one of the basic, in fact, it's it's there in, in everybody, the this idea that the insides of our bodies are really mucky, that they're not good. Augustine says, no, you, you, you're thinking wrongly. It's just because you don't see the beauty of the inside of creation. If you saw creation in its fullness, you would understand how beautiful it is. You would understand, for instance, that all parts of us, even the parts of us that are hidden and covered up now, are actually truly beautiful. They actually fit together. There is an order to them. And so, 
What will happen? But then there's the further question. Why do we need, for instance, why do we need stomachs in heaven given that we don't actually need to eat because we don't actually have anything to make up for which we lose kind of you know we eat because we lose something over the course of the day right he says look parts of the body have various different functions i have hair because it keeps me warm but i also have hair which some of the time at least looks quite decent and and that contributes to who I am as a beautiful person. So in the resurrection, all the parts of the body, even including our inner parts, um, including the parts that we don't need, will actually be shown for their full beauty. So our bodies will, will, will have everything because they're fully beautiful. But then, so, what happens to our lost parts? Firstly, he says, let's look at Christ. When Christ rises from the dead, he rises with his wounds, but they are glorified. Augustine says, something similar might happen with the martyrs. When the martyrs rise, they rise with their, uh, with their wounds, but the wounds are somehow glorified. So if you look at a lot of paintings of um, martyrs, you will see that they're shown with their implements of death, including one of ours, which I didn't put on, but one of ours is, is uh, St. Peter Martyr, who rises with an axe on top of his head, because he was actually killed by an axe being put into his head. Augustine's not sure, but he says the martyrs will rise with this. But then all other imperfection will be remedied. So everybody will rise with perfect bodies. Augustine doesn't think that everybody will rise at the age of 35 uh, or 30 as he thinks Christ was, but he does think everybody will rise in their full perfection, whatever their perfection was. Somewhere between the ages of 29 and 40. And God can make up the missing matter. And of course, um, one of the things uh, Everybody, uh, uh, almost all the men in this room will have to know is that you will rise with beards. <laughs> because beards are, part of the <laughs> beards are part of the perfection of man, according to Augustine. <laughs> the full maturity of man includes a beard. Um, it's not part of the perfection of women. So <laughs> Augustine do wisely doesn't venture into saying what it is that, that, that all women will be born with. But, uh, but he does think, and this is again another important difference from pagan religion, also from a lot of Christian heresy, Augustine thinks women will remain women, that women will have their own glory. Thanks be to God. Yes. So. The old feminist says Augustine. <laughs> There, there is a lot to that, there is a lot to that, but that's a different talk. <laughs> Augustine was brought up by his mother, so <laughs> there's a lot. A yes. Okay. What is important with us, who we are? So our defor deformities, things that are actually de genuinely detract from us, will be taken away, but we will still have our bodies. But then, it doesn't mean that the same matter will return to the same place. It doesn't mean that you know, kind of that atom right at the tip of my finger will return to right to, the, right to that tip of my finger. But all the matter will be there. So Augustine thinks of it still in very material terms to the extent that he still thinks it's the same matter that will be there, even though it's, it's repurposed. So what was my uh, nail might turn out to be part of my hair. Which is, which is an interesting idea. So, how will earthly bodies be in heaven? The bodies will be agile. They will, they will, they will be able to perfectly obey the soul. So, if, the, if, if I would like to run uh, at, at 100 kilometers an hour, I will be able to, because my body will obey me. There will be light. 
Okay, so this gives a basic picture of the resurrection, um, which, which gets taken on. So the idea is our bodies will rise, God will restore all imperfection, we will have all of these special qualities, and we will be, our bodies will be like the resurrected body of Christ. So, Augustine avoids excessive spiritualization. Some parts of, some Christian authors sometimes give a very spirit, excessively spiritualized idea of what the resurrected body will be like. Almost like it will not really be a body. But he says, we will have our internal organs, we will have our sexual organs, we will have our differences, we will have nails and hair and all the other parts of our body, and we will be like roughly like we are, except that the, the body will have some extra qualities. But there are a few, couple of little problems. One is, um, one goes back to um, this sort of idea of the body. The body seems a kind of like an afterthought. So it's a composite of two different beings, like the, the horseman and the chariot. So the horseman is the soul, the chariot and the, and, and the, and the, the chariot is the body, and the, and the, the uh, horses are the you know, parts of the body that make it run, right? So the idea of soul, mind, and body, that's, that's the basic view. But then, why, where does that leave the unity of me, you know, that makes me, me, me? So, we don't speak of ourselves as, I don't speak of, when I address Adriel, I address Adriel, I don't say, hello Adriel soul, how are you this morning? I don't ask her, how is your body this morning? <laughs> um, <laughs> That'd be, uh, that'd be a weird thing to say. It's a weird thing to say because we have this intuition that our bodies are part of who we are, an integral part of who we are, are who we are. We are our bodies. So all of these problems come up again. And so we come to the next part of our body, uh, of our talk rather, which is Thomas Aquinas. So, Thomas takes up this picture of the resurrection, this picture that of what our bodies will be like. Basically, he, he has all the same positions with one significant difference. For, August, for Augustine, the kind of the relationship between soul and body is sort of external. It's a soul ruling a body. For Aquinas, the emphasis is on the fullness of the human nature. And the fullness of human nature is body and soul. A body without a soul is a corpse. A soul without a body is itself incomplete. It, it longs to return to that body. So, there is only one person and that has a body or that is a body. So he starts off with this idea of the relationship between Christ and us. So Christ's resurrection is a bit like our resurrection. So Christ's resurrection is bodily. Our resurrection will also be bodily. It will be bodily in the same way that this is... So you, when you see... When you see uh, Jesus' body, you don't say this is Jesus' body, you say this is Jesus. Even when, when, when we say um, when we say Jesus spent uh, three days in the tomb, we don't just say ooh, your battery power is low. Okay. We don't just say that we don't just say that Jesus' body spent three days in the tomb. We say that God died and God spent three days in the tomb. So in the same way, our fullness will be like Jesus' own fullness. 
So what's the big difference? The big difference is Aquinas' Aristotelian idea that the human body is, human person is a body, its form is given by our soul, rather than the human person being a soul placed somehow on top of a body. He says that it's actually the soul's existence without a body that needs explanation. Because how, what, what, what is it, of, you know, if, if I say um, there is something like the, the bits, the, the formula, the, the relationship between the various bits of this table, what does it mean to say that the table kind of idea exists without the table itself? Right? It's a bit like that. It's a bit like, what does it, it it's, it's something strange for a soul to exist without a body. It's deeply unnatural. So, Aquinas says, for it to be natural, there has to be a continuing relationship with this body, with my body. And that is what will be continued in the, in the, Resurrection. In the resurrection, we will have our souls restored to our bodies, and it's only because there is a future resurrection where that kind of that natural unity will be will remain that we can still say, yes, our souls will continue to exist. Is that clear? Or? Isn't that what the notion is? Is that like because there is a future body awaiting for us oh, yeah. in the mind of God? Yes. Therefore, our souls. Can anticipate that. Can anticipate because that. We don't, because through the, we cannot know anything mm. as souls per se without without some other medium of yes. of knowledge. Because the body, the senses, are mm. the pathway or the ability that enables the soul to know. Yeah, and so it, in in a, in a disembodied soul, mm. uh, cannot know anything without some other kind of medium, whether that be God or yeah. If you think about, for instance, people with uh, dementia, if, you look, if you've ever seen people with dementia, you'll see that their parts of their mind have stopped, uh, brains have stopped working. You know, they're still there, but their brains have stopped working. You will see how much even our ability to think, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's an witness evidence of how much our ability to think depends on the kind of the bodily structure of it. We're not thinking things inserted into a body. We think with our bodies. So, for instance, um, I often had this, I, I used to have, have I, once or twice I've had dreams about this. I've kind of woken, I, I, you know, sometimes you have dreams about death. I'm dead and I'm coming back and I'm seeing. And I had a dream like that, and I, I thought to myself, but how is it that I'm actually seeing all of this and thinking about it? And then I woke up, I never got the answer to that question. <laughs> so, this is why we will have bodies. But keep in mind that our bodies will be transformed, our bodies will be like Christ's own. Just one more thing to say, and then I'll kind of conclude. And, and uh, these are not so, for instance, agility or um, the fact that we will have our bodies will be incorrupt, we won't decay, all of these things. They're not superpowers. They're not things which we have because God is. God wants to be, you know, kind of God's extra generous to us and gives us some additional power which we didn't have in the first place. We have them because that's what it means to be a perfect person. What it means to be a perfect person is to have everything that, to have our souls, our bodies completely able to do whatever they are, to share in Christ's perfection. So the idea of, you know, kind of, the, 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 they are not superpowers. That's just one more thing I wanted to say. And just note, just to note that 
This leaves out some interesting questions again, like how many of the bodily quirks that make me me will remain? That's a mystery, you know, I don't know. Uh, I mean, joking aside, I don't know if all the men in this room will be born with beards. Maybe you're not meant to have beards, I don't know. Um, but you when you grow, I mean, I mean, men as men as men as opposed to women, not men as opposed to men. <laughs> okay. I well. <laughs> so, the other question is: To what extent is my history me? You see what I'm saying is. At some stage in my life, I uh, acquired parts, parts of who I am. And I would say this is part of who I am. This is very much part of who I am. Does that mean that I will still have it in the resurrection? It's an interesting question. Anyway, I'll conclude there and leave the floor open for questions. So, good. Thank you. Doesn't the whole idea of from dust to dust... Mm -hmm.